Good morning, everyone, and it's nice that you're here, despite I heard last night you had a great party from Divisions in Science already going on. Um, I'm Dong Sun, but you can just call me Don, and um, I'm going to give you a brief, brief overview about science communication on stage with actually full story, which, which relates very much to this conference as well. But I thought, because yesterday evening you had a party, maybe I can wake you up by having a live science slam format just for a minute to illustrate you maybe some different ways of communicating science. So can you imagine, now you all are actually neurons here. Can you imagine that for a moment? Okay, so what do neurons do? Neurons fire. But since you cannot get on fire right now, I'll ask you whether you can clap instead of. So, okay, clapping is firing for you. Um, if I raise my hand, then you clap. If I go down, you stop. Let's just try it out whether you're all awake, neurons. Okay, not very enthusiastic, but that's enough. Great job. You, showed, you can be neurons. And actually, what you showed here is the all or nothing principle. Because neurons cannot do something in between. They either fire or they do not. So actually, you have great material to be neurons here. Let's proceed then to the next thing I want to show you. Now, let's imagine you have to fire when you recognize the meaning of an action I'm performing, okay? It could be kind of attacking or can be greeting. So you just have to fire, clap when you see it, right? Okay. Okay. I'm trying to do kind of a Shaolin greeting. You didn't clap to that. Maybe I didn't perform it well. But on the other hand, maybe you didn't know what a Shaolin greeting is because you've never been to Asia or watched those movies. So what you showed in a way is that neurons also can only fire to learn stimuli. So if you haven't learned, if you don't know the connection between a stimulus and to which you have to be activated, you cannot fire. So in a way, you showed in a rough way Hap's rule. Great job. So the third thing is uh, actually something I did in my PhD topic, but I want to show it you, to you by, by having a live experiment too. So please fire now to a reaction you are supposed to react. Maybe you all know it. So what do Asians do very often? They sometimes do martial arts. So let's divide the room from here. If you uh, see me performing any kind of martial arts related actions, you fire from here to here. If you see me um, doing a selfie, that's also what Asians do a lot, then you have to fire. Okay, let's try it out. Whether the neurons are awake? Okay. Okay. I see. You stop firing very fast. But usually, if I keep on taking selfie again and again and again and again, you will stop clapping. Because anything which is repeated is boring, right? So if you didn't feel like clapping anymore, you did it exactly right. Because that's also what neurons do. When a neuron is activated to the same stimulus again and again and again, it doesn't want to fire anymore, and it's called neuronal adaptation. So what you showed here are three fundamental principles in any neuroscience textbook. The all or nothing principle, Hap's rule, and neural adaptation. Thank you very much for this like brief, brief, different way of presentation. So why did I come up with this kind of presentation techniques? Actually, it all, uh, by the way, you all were great super neurons. Yeah, I, I, I forgot to thank you all. Thanks for participating here in the morning. So what it all started was actually 2013 when, when I was one of the co-organizers of Visions in Science conference. And we wanted to let people present their own research in a very brief, condensed format, in a science slam format. There I had to try out the first time ever to tell other people about what neurons in the brain do, but being creative, using a different way of presenting it. And although it might have appeared silly to you all, actually this kind of presenting science in a funny way, in an understandable way, um, on stage was really fruitful from that point on. And I will maybe tell you at the end of the talk how fruitful all this was. But it also let me do more science communication uh, on stage. I went to more than 60 different talks on stages in different clubs in Germany and Europe in the last one and a half year. And actually also started together with Dennis, teach a little bit about what Science Slam can all do. And Usually this is a two days course, but I will try to give you the condensed part of it right now in about 30 minutes. So the slides are based on uh, some slides Dennis has provided to me 
and parts of it is from me. And maybe from the last year's Vision in Conference, Vision in Science Conference, you already might know a few parts, but let me refresh that. So the first question I always ask is, we all think we know what communication is about, but what do you think good communication is? So just randomly, because you're sitting in the front row, I ask Ilya, what do you think? What is good communication, Ilya? It's when people interact and they understand each other. When people interact and understand each other. Uh, you're an expert. You already gave a talk, in a way, about communication. I will skip and go to second row. And what do you think is something for good communication? Being clear. Being clear. That's very good. Any other ideas? Just out of the gut? What could be communication? So in a way, we define it usually is very simple. It's just about making people understand the point. But although it sounds very simple, it is actually more complicated because in a way, make other people understand something is like a prism. So you have a message or you have a content, a knowledge you want to deliver to others, but it all depends on who are the receivers, right? So for example, if you have to give a talk to policymakers, you cannot come up with all this special knowledge. You have to make the point in a way to say, do my voters care? Would people support me if I support this kind of line of animal research? How can I explain to my people that they think it's good research and they should support also the politicians supporting this research? So I have to make this point to them. In a way, if I talk to industry, they have to see whether it is somehow fruitful and they can money out of it in the next years. Or if you talk to NGOs, you have to see whether it fits their agenda. It might be very difficult to let, for example, Greenpeace support your research in a way when you have to do something with chemical compounds and new. It depends on all the scope of this agenda of these NGOs. And also, if you go to conferences, as you know, you always choose those sessions which are interesting for you in a way. They ask themselves, does it relate to my work? And also for the media, all they think about is, is it news? Will it sell? That means you have a content, you have a message, but it is very important to tar target this different audience in a way that it is relevant for them and you talk in their own language. So in our definition of Dennis and me and what we think is that's all what is communication about and also to the public, it is we have to make it clear why does it matter to them? Why should I listen to some kind of nanoparticles or cars or networks? You, we have to make it relevant in a way. Although for ourselves, it sometimes appears so obvious why it is relevant. So in another way, it is also actually a discussion I, I start with people. But science communication, why is it so important? There, there are several reasons. I mean, usually many, many of the reasons we say is because the public, the general audience, also has a right to know what their money is spent on, right? We often forget, we get fundings, we get fundings from governments or from the EU, but that is all taxpayers' money. So in a way, they also have the right to know what is it invested on, what is done with it. So it's a, it's a right of the public. On the other hand, it also, it, so in my own personal um, point of view, I think it's also very important because science scientists often tend to think that the impact of the work is not so big on what is going on in the society or political decisions, right? But in a way, in the recent years, what I call is, um, so maybe I can summarize it in a way why science communication is so important by quoting Bertrand Russell, because he says, the whole problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves and wiser people so full of doubts. And I think you can see it everywhere, I think, especially these days in politics, but also sometimes in science. So I think those ones who are supposed to be much fuller of doubts should sometimes also approach other people to, to talk to them about even those things you are doubting and you're working on, right? So one thing is, for example, I call the politicization of scientific results. You all might know, but Climate change debate. It, is a, it used to be a scientific debate. But these days, for, for example, in the United States, if you look whether you believe in climate change or not, it depends whether you're Democrat or you're Republican. So if you're Republican, actually, you're not supposed to believe in climate change. So maybe these kind of pictures are accurately depicting what might be 
soon in the future there, right? I mean, and also another debate, this is slightly different from the Republican Democrats, but even in Germany, some people who are very eco or very ecologically minded or green, sometimes they have a big aversion against the vaccine, uh, vaccinations of children, which is one of the greatest achievements of humanities because we fought very successfully those diseases, right? But it somehow became also political issues. And also in the United States, it, it's kind of divided to the West Coast, East Coast, but also in Germany, you can see, depending on which political spectrum people are be belonging to, you either believe in it or not. But this is not a matter of belief or opinions, right? And here comes the problem of science communication into play. Because the way scientists are dealing with the media, with news, or with all those people who are not believing it, is often in a way still using our own vocabulary or our way of, I know better, I can teach, I'm an expert, but some people just don't want to listen to it, right? So what can we do about it? This is one of my own personal motivation. One thing we can do is we should all try, even before we are expert scientists, why we are still students also, go and talk to the public, a public, and we have to learn how to effectively communicate. I mean, this is probably an old or also new topic, but my own affiliation is the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics. Maybe a lot of you might have heard of our institute by the problems regarding animal research or monkey research, right? So here, the problem was also we, from the point of view, from an ethical point of view, or from a regulation point of view, our institute was doing everything correct until a reporter came undercover, filmed doing research or uh, operations on monkeys, and then went to the broad public and made it like a, something bad thing by claiming he did it undercover. And actually, all of our institute's members have been Threat, got threatening emails, someone, I mean, someone sent us, you should die, or we are going to kill you, terrors, like all kinds of accusations, and even people who are not working with animals were part of it. But in a way, in a bigger sense, why, why these people are dealing with this, later we found out is they have a kind of a prejudice, they are not properly informed about why animal research is good, in which ways they are conducted, and what we are really doing. So instead of not talking to the public, which some people think is a good idea in this kind of crisis, it is actually a solution to talk more to the public, invite them to the institutes, really show transparently what is going on, and increase an understanding of them. And also, the third point I think is very important is provide more knowledge to people so they can sometimes count one and one together and see the evidence for climate change and also for vaccination. I think it's a good way to deal with it. And you should actually start before people are becoming too politicized and having their own beliefs. You should provide them knowledge beforehand. So I think in that sense, science communication is very, very important. It is my own personal belief. And I also think it's something maybe all of you should also, at a certain point, think about. Right. And this is one of the key points I want to make when, whenever we have some conferences or talking about science communication. We are cursed by our own knowledges. Maybe you remember when you were first semester and you started a lecture from a professor. Maybe you thought this is a little bit too hard for me because what is very basic for the professor's level might be not so basic for you, right? And it's the same for the general audience. You sometimes assume this is so basic for me, so the way you communicate science to a general audience has already a lot of special knowledge in it, but you just don't realize it because you have by yourself so much knowledge. So in a way, I, I really like this funny picture because this is the professor. He is very smart. He has a lot of formulas. He probably gave a great lecture, but still a guy comes and say, hey, someone on Twitter said you're wrong. And actually, he believes more what one of his random contacts on Twitter are just tweeting in a few sentences than this fact and knowledge of this professor. And although it's sad, it is often the case. So even as a scientist, sometimes you, might, you must kind of practice to bring down your own knowledge or the point accessible for the general public, even sometimes in form of Twitter. What was the name of the journal, Dennis? Uh, the journal for where it is allowed, you, you have only very limited space of, um, um, can you tell the name of the journal again? You, you had the name of a journal. 
the way you can publish results only very briefly. The Journal of I can look it up and then post it later. OK, sorry. So how to escape from the curse? It's very simple. Talk to more people from outside of your field, especially to non-scientists. Sometimes explaining your own research to your mother is, could be fruitful, or maybe to your nephew, because they sometimes ask very naive questions, which really are very important questions, which makes you realize, ah, OK, maybe I need to deal better with this question. And also try out different formats of communicating science to a broader public. And as you probably already have mentioned, be as easy, clear, and concise as possible. So I want to give you a brief overview of other ways of communicating science than peer-reviewed journals, F1000, or different other kind of uh, methods of professionally communicating your science. So one way is uh, communicating via social media. And it has been becoming a topic by itself. So many people are aware that actually a few lines of Twitter reports have a huge impact. For example, blogs and tweets, um, with, which are ripping these papers apart within days of publication. Um, these leave, leave researchers unsure how to react. It means um, sometimes the impact of your research, which can be only measured after it's out, after days, weeks, and months, what other scientists think, uh, you already get some reactions via Twitter much faster. And it has been shown that actually um, the metrics of social impact based on Twitter or the social media, so those articles many people tweeted about were 11 times more likely to be highly cited, and those tweetations are also sometimes used as early sign of which research might be significantly comp contributing, at least in, in the light of media and news, which research is uh, focused and highlighted very much. And also, this is a little bit old because uh, this channel also is not so great as it used to be anymore. But there is um, I fucking love science, IFLS site. And sometimes they post throughout the whole week new research they find interesting. And lots of lots of people read this research. So just to give you a brief comparison from the Richard Dawkins Foundation, they posted something on Facebook. And as you can see here, you see around uh, 3,000 likes and 1,000 shares. But actually, after it has been posted to this one site, which loves scientific articles and posts it, you see thir over 30,000 likes and over uh, 9,000 um, shares. So those research can get much more public impact if they are also posted by one of those uh, web page. Same for the gen genetic engineering techniques from Nature Journal. You see 200 likes and 71 shares, but after it has been posted here in this uh, web page, you see also over 90,000 likes and 23,000 um, shares. That means actually even people who don't have a clue about science think this is really cool research and like it and talk about it, which raises the impact of your own research as well. So what kind of other communication channels do exist? There are science slams. This is what I participated very much. So everyone can host science slams, and everyone can actually be part of science slams. There are different rules and prices at each competition. Normally, it's 10 minutes, except in the vision in science, because we have so many great people who wanted to attend. It's five minutes. But also in, in Austria, it is five minutes. So it's normally 10 minutes, but there are different rules. So you can use PowerPoint slides or different presentation slides, and you can bring on stage whatever you can carry. And the nice thing is it's usually judged by a general audience. So everyone in the audience can be one of the judges and say, I like it. I learned something new, and then can judge this research. Another format is FameLab. And I know that Alfredo also has been participating this year, and Dennis in a few years back. I participated last year. So it's hosted by British Council. Same rules for all competitions. There are more than 30 countries around the whole globe participating in that. So actually, it's multi-steps, multi-levels. You start by your own city, then your own region, then you go Germany-wide. If you win, one person is sent to the FameLab International, and then you again compete. And here, actually, only science, technology, engineering, um, and, and some natural science scientists can participate. Three minutes talk, and no presentation slides allowed. That means you just have to tell a story without any slides. But you can bring on stage anything you can illustrate with, for example, yeah, different, different kind of, to use metaphors. And this is judged by a jury of experts, which can be sometimes a little bit. 
problematic. Another format, and then you can win media training and money. So actually, um, if, you, if you are passing the German-wide uh, pre-selections, you get a media training by an expert from BBC or different experts coming from Britain, and they also give you a little bit of money. Then also in, here in Berlin, they have this called Falling Walls Lab to, com to commemorate the German falling walls, fallings of the wall. So they actually allow not only scientists, but also um, different IT people, different startups to participate. It's hosted by Falling Walls Foundation. All research areas, including humanities, can participate, but also startups and business people can um, be part of it. Same rules worldwide for all competitions. It's also three minute talks. But you can use presentation slides, but only three slides. Uh, judged by the general audience and an expert jury, it's a combination of it. And uh, if you want to host this in any institution, follow the rules. They actually support you with money and all the setups, so actually anyone can host it. And it has a lot of different uh, so support from the foundation. And also, probably I will skip this, you know TED Talks, everyone knows. Uh, technology, um, education, design. Um, so worldwide, most popular format of science talk. It goes roughly, it's allowed only 18 minutes, but it can go up to 20 minutes sometimes. But it has a little bit more time. You can speak about, they're very famous speakers. They use mostly presentation slides. And it's for a really broad audience. So to summing up, if you really want to communicate science to a broader public, you can actually use all these online channels, uh, even YouTube channels, I didn't talk about them much, or science blogs, or even from the famous science magazine, they have uh, every year a competition called Dance Your PhD, so if you can express your own topic in a dance or a music video showing your own dance, uh, yeah, you will be shown on science magazine um, online. And you have different talks on stage to sum it up, Fame Lab, Falling Walls, or UTSIS in three minutes in the United States, they're all three minutes. You have science slams, and some of the science slams you will see this afternoon. TED Talks or science notes or different formats where you can talk on the stage and talk to people freely. So about the general tips for presentation, this was actually for those people who should prepare a science slam. But I think I will just um, skip this part, or I can just make it very brief, which means it's all about storytelling, and storytelling means you have to aim the right audience, as I said in the beginning. You have to uh, use your given time, however short or long it is, and um, use the right tools for it. Um, I will go to the end then, because we are a little bit behind the time. Um, yeah, the technical tips, I will also skip. Yeah, so for science slams, why science slam? A brief summary. It is a good training for your own presentation skills. And you might need them in different circumstances. You might need them for your own lab report at conferences, but also sometimes later if you apply for fundings or grant applications, you also need good presentation skills. Or you, if you want to found your own company and you want to get an angel investing in your company, you might also need good presentation skills. So just by trying out these science slams or fame lab formats of science communication on stage, it's a great training for you in general. And also, it makes science easier to understand, and you get a lot of feedback of people who are non-scientists. Maybe, I, I was really shocked when I actually looked and saw how many uh, scientist friends I have. And uh, if you compare the number of scientist friends and non-scientist friends towards the end of your PhD, you might be surprised that most of your contacts are actually somehow related to science. Depends on, right? But I mean, it is very useful to talk to non-scientists. And also, it is important, as I have emphasized already before, to make science easier to understand. And what I really like is it also promotes interdisciplinary crosstalk between different research areas, but also between academia and industry. Um, so after giving science slam talks, I have been approached by different institutes of people who wanted to collaborate using the same motion capture technology. And some kind of connections or new project would never have been arise if I have not given the science slam talks on stage. Um, and also, just this is a very pragmatic issue, but it raises the impact of your scientific outputs in terms of citations or news reports or even with funding opportunities. So actually, you should not miss it. Try it out. And just as a personal 
story what Science Slams brought me, because this was addressed in 2013, Visions in Science, the second one. And it was the first time ever in my life that I had to give a Science Slam presentation, and I somehow accidentally won. I think I accidentally won because if, when I wanted to give my Science Slam presentation, actually there was a technical problem, and I had to restart five times. And at the, five, at, the, at the fifth time when I just restarted, everyone was already laughing because it was so funny. But in a way, I won it. I found it great. Then actually Dennis, who is here uh, also, who is a founder of a, a media company, he actually encouraged me to take part in Science Slams. So I started competing in Science Slams, won the Science Slam in 2014 from the ministry, won the German wine competition from FameLab, and then um, had the opportunity to give a TEDx talk, then some uh, organized in great halls, different Science Slams, more than 60 times in the last one and a half years, and some RTL, it's not very glorious, but some TV shows asked me to be part of their panels. And actually, finally, one of my dreams since I was a re really like a little child was writing a book, a popular scientific book people read and like. So based on all these papers I learned in my PhD work, actually I managed to write a book, and it will be out in three days in the bookstores. Um, and this all has been only possible by being here at Vision in Science and trying out science slams. And I was really amazed how these processes rolled forward by just having a funny talk and I want people to understand what I'm doing in my research, somehow became really big and now uh, I spent probably more than half of my time also doing professional science communication, including this book work. And those of you who maybe speak German or are interested can watch me on Markus Lanz, a talk show on the 27th, it's uh, in two weeks, but all started by Visions in Science. And thank you for listening, me, listening to me. You are a great super audience. Thank you for being here and being part of Vision in Science. Thanks to the organizers again. Thank you very much, Don. <clears throat> Are there any